Hello guys, Oscar Hotel 8 Sierra Tango November Julian here for Off Grid Ham Radio. What you're looking at now is a Winlink session. We're using an ICOM IC705, operating QRP, trying to send and receive email messages, but we're not having any success. And QRP is great until it isn't, and right now is one of those moments. Now, if you've been around the channel for a while, you'll already know that QRP is the goal. That's the way we like to do things around here. We don't want to use too much power, too much current. We try to keep things efficient. If you're new here, QRP is what we call low power communications in ham radio. We use only enough power, which is enough to make the contact and nothing more. This, as opposed to QRO operating, which is more of a brute force attack, a way of putting maximum power, maximum pressure, to get the communications we want done. QRP is lightweight, efficient, and low power. In contrast, QRO requires more weight, more gear, and more battery power but uh, it is also more effective. Now, the reason this particular wind link session isn't working out is propagation. Propagation doesn't always cooperate with us, and sometimes we need to either change an antenna configuration or a uh, Worst case scenario, we need to brute force that connection with more power. So here I'm using 10 watts, which is normally absolutely enough to make these type of connections. Unfortunately, if propagation isn't cooperating between myself and the station I'm trying to connect to, that 10 watts might not get us above the noise floor for the receiving station. In a grid down scenario or some type of disaster, where we need to get that message out, that brute force approach is definitely going to be advantageous. Now, there are several reasons we might not be able to make that connection. Of course, as I already mentioned, solar conditions or propagation. Also, distance to target. Maybe our antennas are configured for NVIS or, or regional communications, but the station we're trying to reach is further out and uh, our antenna configuration doesn't allow it. The terrain, maybe we can't uh, shoot an azimuth outside of a valley. We're surrounded by mountains or things like that. And again, the antenna configuration isn't allowing us to make that contact. Or perhaps there's QRM, simple interference or noise, man-made or otherwise, which is uh, preventing us from, again, achieving that contact. In theory, 5 to 10 watts can do amazing things. We've seen it on the channel. And I've practiced that for years and years and years. Unfortunately, radio and propagation don't always agree, and they don't always play well together. So, when you absolutely have to get that message out, and you've tried everything else, perhaps what we need, when we need to be heard, is an HF amplifier. Now, the HF amplifier isn't a replacement for QRP, and we don't want to suggest operators will always try QRO first. QRP should always be our standard operating procedure. However, when our situational emphasis is on emergency coordination, tactical messages, preparedness, or just getting that wind link connection to that distant RMS station, it's absolutely okay to deploy an HF amplifier. So, we've decided that, yes, okay, an HF amplifier in our toolbox is a great idea. So, what specs matter the most when we're in the field? Now, to be fair, all of these are equally as important, but um, depending on how we operate, or where we operate, or what type of gear we're able to carry, we'll put more importance on some of them than the others. But that's up to the individual operator. So. For me, low current draw, which is critical for battery-based systems. Uh, it's got to be lightweight and compact, field packable. And I don't mean that we can pack it in a Land Rover or a Jeep. 
I mean that we can pack it in a backpack with our QRP gear. It needs to be rugged. We don't want something that's too fragile. It's going to break out in the field, and there's no point to take anything like that out there. It needs to have a wide voltage input, for example, 11 to 15 volts. This way, we can run it directly off of our lithium iron phosphate battery or 12 volt lead acid. An integrated antenna toner is nice to have, but to, anyway, it's optional. And an efficient final stage. I don't know if you guys remember, but years ago, I did a current consumption test on the Yaesu FT891. 22 amps for 100 watts. Today, I have a portable amplifier that can also do 100 watts, but it's only pulling about 10 to 12 amps maximum. Efficient final stage, because this is going to help us with the amount of batteries we have to carry along to power our stations. Now, with all that said, when we consider current consumption of receive, transmit efficiency, size, and weight, there's only really one amplifier that meets or exceeds those requirements, and that's an amplifier you've seen on the channel before. It's from Delta Lima 4 Kilo Alpha. It's the PA500 HF amplifier. Now I have two of them here. I have the PA500, the standard model, and I have the PA500E Echo for Expedition. I'm going to show them both to you. So there's two different models of the DL4 Kilo Alpha PA500 amplifier. There's the basic model. And the specs for the basic model are 60 watts of RF output. Uh, it can handle an input drive up to 5 watts. Uh, operational range 80 meters through 10 meters. Uh, receive current draw, I've measured about 50 milliamps at 13.8 volts. Transmit current at 60 watts, about 10 amps at 13.8 volts. Uh, built in antenna tuner. Uh, passive cooling, and the case is CNC machined aluminium. Now, you can also trigger it with its internal Vox push-to-talk, or you can wire it directly to trigger the push-to-talk manually via the radio. For the PA500E Expedition model, the specs are output power of 80 to 100 watts, an input drive up to 5 watts, Operating range between 80 meters and 10 meters. Receive current draw, again, I've measured 50 milliamps at 13.8 volts. Transmit output at 13.8, 80 watts at 10 amps. Transmit output at 16 to 18 volts, 100 watts at 10 amps. It also has a built-in antenna tuner. The cooling is active with dual fans and the case, just like the PA500, is CNC machined aluminium. Now both of these amplifiers have built-in safeguards, <laughs> making them rather idiot-proof. So reverse polarity protection on the DC input. This means if you mistakenly mix up the plus and minus leads when connecting it up, you won't destroy the amplifier. Input drive protection. I believe this is some sort of attenuation. So if you happen to input more than 5 watts, it'll fold back, attenuate that, and protect the amplifier. Over temperature protection. Both amplifiers have over temperature protection built in. On the Expedition model, there are temperature controlled fans, which switch on and off depending on the internal temperature of the amplifier. There's also additional circuits to protect the internal LDMOS amplifier. Negative voltage spike protection and over voltage protection uh, for gate voltages of the LDMOS transistor. When you pick up either of these amplifiers, I can tell you they feel like a brick. I mean, it feels like a solid piece of aluminum uh, that you couldn't break, or if you wanted to, you can use as a weapon. This is the kind of robustness I'm talking about. We need equipment which will survive the backpack, survive the field, and be ready to operate regardless of the conditions. Now, to be fair, all of these features are great, but only if you can carry the thing 
The PA500 comes in at 821, 822 grams or one pound 13 ounces. The PA500 Expedition model comes in at 944 grams or two pounds, 1.3 ounces. Now to be fair, no one wants to add extra weight to their packs, but if I compare it to the weight of an ICOM IC7300 or an FT891, 991 Alpha, or whatever other QRO radio, the PA500 series of amplifiers are more efficient, lighter in weight, and the only downside I see is they're not built into our radio. Personally, I like to think of it in the way that uh, I'd rather have it with me and not need it than to need it and not have it with me. The option is absolutely critical when you need to get those messages in and out. So, if you're interested in the PA500 or the PA500 Expedition model, you can find them both at Oliver's website, DIY599.net. You can buy them directly from there, as well as other innovative products that he's developed for the ham radio community. Now, even though I almost always operate QRP or up to 10 watts, I almost always have the PA500 Expedition model with me. There's been too many of those times when conditions were just so poor that I couldn't get out to the stations I was trying to get out to. So it's nice to have that QRP mindset, but have a backup plan for emergency communications just in case. All right, guys, look, if you like what I'm doing, if you like the content I'm creating, let me know by leaving me a comment and or a thumbs up. Or if you're really motivated, why don't you go ahead and buy one of my books? You'll find the links in the description. And if it's not too much to ask, please share this video with someone or somewhere where other operators might find it useful. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you on the flip side. Rock and roll, guys. Ciao. Julian, Julian, QSL Dom. Okay, Julian, okay, okay. Oscar, Hotel 8, Sierra Tango, November. Uh, that's right, you are portable? Yes, Dom, we are portable today. Near my home, not very far from home, but portable uh, in the forest with my dog, QSL. Five, uh, five, six, uh, with not your basic or no problem to get your uh, cosine, uh, here, Julian. Anyway, uh, good, uh, have a nice, uh, and enjoy the band with your portable station, and uh, no problem to get your transmission at the moment. Name here is Tom, that's Oscar Mike, and I'm located near the city of Milan in northern part of Italy. QSL? QSL, Dom. Uh, QSL, your report. Five nine, five nine. I've been listening to you for five or ten minutes now. Wonderful station, doing a wonderful job. We are located.